Hello, everybody. Glad y'all are joining us this morning. Uh, just a, a few housekeeping items before we introduce Laura. Uh, we, uh, we will be recording this presentation uh, and we'll put it on the playlist for uh, the YouTube playlist for these Master Naturalist Presents series. So uh, we'd ask if folks would make sure that uh, uh, you should be coming in with your um, your mic muted, but if you would also turn your camera off, then that will just uh, that will just help uh, things be smooth and uh, make sure you're not captured for uh, immortality. So uh, I want to welcome everybody to Master Naturalist Presents Noticing Nature Insect Appreciation 101. Today's presenter is Laura Kimberly. Laura is a Texas Master Naturalist with the North Texas chapter and has completed the Master of Volunteer Entomology training. She's a regular volunteer at the Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, commonly known as the Leela Nature Preserve. She leads butterfly walks at Leela and works on the Prairie Restoration Project where she has honed her observational and photography skills with the many opportunities to notice insects hidden among the grasses, flowers, and trees. Laura is an entomology enthusiast, an insect advocate, a walker, hiker, backpacker, and camper. Noticing nature, especially of the six-legged kind, is her favorite pastime. Welcome, Laura. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Thank you again, Greg. I, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I really welcome the opportunity to share my fascination with insects uh, with, with anyone who will listen. So everyone today, um, as Greg mentions, I am a regular volunteer with habitat restoration projects, primarily at the Leela Nature Preserve up in Louisville and some other of the other uh, very beautiful natural areas around the Dallas Metroplex. In, in these places with rich diversity, insects thrive and have really presented themselves for observation. And I feel like they demanded that I learn more about them and know their value and advocate for them. And um, <clears throat> that is what I intend to do today. But before we get started in earnest, um, I wanna give you a heads up. You might want to get a piece of paper and a pen or pencil. Uh, there'll be a couple of challenges you uh, might uh, need to write down some answers or want to write down some answers, or you can just keep them in your head. Insects comprise 80% of all animal species on earth. About 1 million species have been described and entomologists know that there are many more, but we don't always see them. And more often we hear the negatives about disease vectors and crop and garden pests and the home wreckers. Um, and um, I'd like to paint a different picture. So I'd like to start out by asking you, do you have a good, a moderate or a bad impression of insects? I'll ask you that question again at the end. <clears throat> Only about 1% of insects cause harm. And because there's a lot of insects, that actually can be a lot of harm, I grant you. But there's a lot of benefits to insects too. Most of the insects are either harmless or actually helpful to humans. So before you swat, take a closer look and remember the good. Pollinating, dispersing seeds, nourishing the birds, cleaning up after other animals and plants, and keeping each other in check solving crimes and providing enjoyment for nature watchers and inspiration for technological development and sci-fi movies. You might, sometimes when you look at an insect, you might recognize a Star Wars character. So I invite you to stare at the ground, the flowers and the tree bark 
to look at the insects today through my lens and hopefully tomorrow through yours. Get closer and closer, closer and, and closer to inspect and notice. Nature will bear the closest inspection. She invites us to lay our eye level with her smallest leaf and take an insect view of its plane. Train your eyes and brain to notice the tiny, colorful, camouflage fast and deceitful world of the most diverse class of animals on earth. Now I would venture to say that my smartphone probably had a little bit to do with my insect fascination because it's like having a microscope in your pocket. You can take a photo and then pinch and zoom and crop to see all the colors and patterns and bristles and scales and fuzz and shapes and all that make up an insect. And you begin to notice, oh wait, um, this looks like, oh, I thought it was a wasp, but look, it's a beetle or a fly. Um, the photos allow, allow me to share my fascination one-on-one -on -one, or here today where I'll weave in some facts about insects. What is an insect? What are the different types? Orders, um, orders in entomology lingo. Um, what does it eat? How does it help? And tips you can use to recognize what and what. What is what as we take this photographic walk among the bugs of the Dallas Metroplex? So this is kind of a beginner's look. Um, so we'll start with a little challenge here. Um, there are nine insects pictured. See if you can identify them using their commonly known categories. Um, it's not exactly a one-on-one -on -one match. So uh, take a minute, uh, take a look, write it down or, or just uh, note it in your head. I'll give you a, Give you 30 seconds or so here to see what you think. Okay, now set that aside um, and you can check yourself as we go along today and we'll do a final check at the end. So before we look at specific insects, let's start with um, some basics. Insects have an exoskeleton. The parts of their body that provide structure are on the outside and the soft parts are on the inside. Now for us humans, the bones, our structural support are on the inside. So that's a big difference between humans and insects. Insects have three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They have six legs, and those legs are attached to each side of the thorax. So they have three pair. They also may have wings attached to the thorax. Um, for, the, for the most part today, we're sticking with those that have wings, but just remember, there are, there are some that don't. And all of those locomotion parts, the legs and the wings, are attached to that one powerful body part, the thorax. But, during their early life, most are a bit more squishy. For the butterflies and moths, flies, wasps, bees, and ants, and the beetles, life begins as an egg that hatches into a larva, which is a worm-like phase that also might be called a caterpillar or a grub. It grows in stages called instars, and at each instar, it molts, meaning the outer surface splits and a larger, more developed larger larva emerges. And after that last molt, the insect creates a pupa. And for some insects, that's called a cocoon or a chrysalis. And inside that pupa, it transforms into an adult. For most insects, that means it develops wings and longer legs, perhaps a little variation of the mouth, mouth parts. 
And this type of life cycle is generally referred to as full or complete metamorphosis. Now, if it has wings, it is an adult. No baby flies or butterflies with wings. If you see something tiny flying, it's just a tiny, tiny adult. And in these different stages of life, the insect may eat different things as a larva than it does as an adult. So it might have a different impact on um, humans and plants or ecosystems in each stage of their life. The true bugs, though, have a different life cycle. Wait, true bugs? They're not all true? <laughs> yes, not all insects are bugs, even though in popular ter terminology, uh, we tend to call all of them bugs. It's okay, but now you know a fun fact that to en entomologists, bug means something quite specific. And the true bugs, still start as an egg, but they hatch looking a bit more like the adult form, but still developing. Um, in that developmental stage, it's called a nymph. So these are the nymphs. And nymphs um, also develop through instars where they shed their exoskeleton as they get larger and finally developing a full set of wings. And you can see in this little aggregation of, of these milkweed bugs that the nymphs have partially developed wings and the adults have the, the full wings. You see the netting on that wing right there. This type of life cycle is generally referred to as partial metamorphosis. So um, here we have some black and orange insects. At first glance, they may look like they're the same. Um, and to distinguish one species from another, uh, often entomologists actually have to look inside the insect. But today we're looking at basic observational details to distinguish one insect order from another. Um, and remember, I'm just focusing on five insect orders um, to keep it kind of um, um, manageable. I'm focusing on the bees, wasps, and ants, which are in the order Hymenoptera, the flies in the order Diptera, beetles, the coleoptera, bugs, the hemipterans, and butterflies and moths, the lepidoptera. And also, I, I'm just going to talk about the good insects today. Um, all of these insects, maybe, maybe one is not, but they're beneficial in some way. Even that one has some benefits. So let's start with number six from our challenge. What do you think this is? It might remind you of a housefly. And it is a fly, but it's a, it's a bristle fly. The general category called flies have many feeding habits and lifestyles. Um, this one, though similar to the housefly, has, has, has a similar pattern and coloring. Um, but as an adult, it feeds on nectar and can even pollinate and as a larva is a parasite of other insects. The housefly, um, its um, food specialty is decomposing matter. So this insect actually helps in pest control. But how would you know that this is a fly just by looking at it? Now the flies are unique among insects. They have just one pair of wings, giving it its scientific name, Diptera meaning two wings, diptera. Um, all the other flying insects have four wings. Um, often, but not always, the fly body is, is smooth. Um, but the biggest visual giveaway, because you can't often tell if there's two wings or four on that little insect sitting on a flower, but the biggest visual giveaway is that it usually has small antenna, and large eyes in relation to the head. So back to our bristle fly. Big eyes, check. Small, smallish antenna, check. Body, uh, not so smooth, but it's not hairy, it's bristly. Um, and the bristles on the fly function as chemical receptors, which is how they smell and um, to some degree taste their environment. But they do have a, um, a tongue, which is a sponging mouth part, 
which they use to soak up um, liquid nectar as an adult. So how about this insect? Um, it is a fly also. And how do you know? We got those big eyes, very small antenna. Um, and not the kind of filament antenna we know of bees. It, it does have two wings. Kind of, you can kind of see that in this insect, no overlapping um, structures here. But what does it remind you of? Are these the same species? On the left is a drone fly. On the right is the honeybee drone. So the drone fly is named after um, the insect that it mimics. So what makes a bee? Or what, what, how do we recognize a bee? Uh, the bees have a pair of wings, four all together. <clears throat> I can attest though that often it is hard to tell if an insect has four wings or two. Instead, it's, it's um, a little bit easier to look at the body, the eyes and the antenna. Generally, they have longer antenna and smaller eyes in relation to the size of the head. Um, and they have a, a more pinched waist than a fly does. So, some bees more so than others. But this fly really wants other animals to think it is a bee. So it's got the coloring of the honeybee um, and a little bit more hair than usual. And it mimics the bee for protection. It doesn't have a stinger, um, but other animals might think it does and they will avoid it. And fortunately for the flowers, the drone fly has plenty of hairs to pick up some pollen and move it around, even though it is actually on, on the flower only to nectar, not to collect pollen. But you can see the grains of pollen on the hairs um, of this tip of this abdomen and um, on its legs. Um, it doesn't need the pollen, uh, but the bee does. Well, you might ask, well, why isn't that honeybee carrying pollen? Well, the drone is a male and it is on the flower only for the nectar. It's the females that carry the pollen. I mean, when you see honeybees on a flower, um, look for the pollen baskets on the hind legs. That will help you distinguish it from the male from the female and helps you distinguish the bee from the fly. The presence of the clump of pollen identifies this as a female worker bee. While they um, have hairs that do pick up pollen, to carry it back to the nest, the bee will use her front legs to groom the pollen from her body and pack it into special structures on the hind legs. Those structures are, are they're called corbicula. Now, this is not a honeybee, uh, though it does have a lot in common with the honeybee. You may recognize this as the bumblebee. They also pack pollen into those special structures, the corbicula. Honeybees and bumblebees are, are both um, social bees. That's another thing they have in common. Each species lives in nests and they each have a social structure with a queen bee who lays the eggs female worker bees who collect the pollen to feed the colony and also keep the nest clean and protect it. Bumblebees and honeybees sting to defend their nest, but only the females can sting uh, since the stinger actually evolved from the um, egg laying apparatus. So the next time you notice the male bees, Notice that they're just enjoying the forage. Um, as, but they do pick up a little bit of pollen and move it from flower to flower. You can see some grains of pollen on um, this um, honeybee and on the legs of this bumblebee. Now, um, honeybees and bumblebees are probably the most familiar bees to most people. 
um, they have that social structure living in one colony. Um, but there are many kinds of bees with varying lifestyles and reproductive strategies. Um, and actually most bees are solitary. Each female builds, maintains, and provisions her own nests. This is the um, one of the sunflower bees, one of my favorite bees with, with those lovely eyes and those big hairy hind legs that are, um, and they're just fun to watch when they are gathering pollen and slipping nectar on um, sunflowers. Um, and it, um, it's, um, it's one of the sunflower bees. There are actually several um, different sunflower bees. It's named because they tend to specialize on sunflowers. So she's one that doesn't live in a colony with workers to help. She is responsible for making her own nest, nest and providing the pollen. Um, now she might nest in the vicinity of other females for, that's probably for a little protection, uh, but they're more communal than, um, than, than they would have social structures. And another difference between this bee and the um, bumblebees and honeybees is that she has, uh, doesn't have those pollen baskets. She has very dense hairs on her hind legs to carry the pollen. So there's different strategies for carrying pollen uh, depending on the bee, just like there's different strategies for, for nesting and raising young. Um, another strategy for carrying pollen is um, that of this leaf cutter bee. She packs the pollen into dense hairs on her abdomen. Um, they're also very fun to watch um, because not wanting to give up the pollen they've already packed in, they, uh, they'll crawl around a flower with their abdomen up in the air. Um, another um, function of that, that pinched waist that allows her to move it up and down a little bit more. Um, they chew out a little oval from a leaf to take it back um, to the nest to house the egg. And so that's how they get their name, the leaf cutter bees. And again, there's a variety of leaf cutter bees. Um, easy to identify the category, but oftentimes hard to identify the specific species. This insect may look like a bee, but it's a wasp. This is one of the sand wasps, named for their ground nesting lifestyle. They provision their young with flies. So how do, you, how do we recognize a wasp? The main difference between bees and wasps is not really a physical characteristic, but a feeding habit. For the most part, bees are the vegetarians, feeding on the pollen of plants, and the wasps are the carnivores, feeding on other insects. Now, as adults, many wasps are sustained by nectar. Um, they get that carnivore reputation because the adult female will take um, another insect or a caterpillar back to the nest for her young, because uh, the young need more substantial uh, protein. So the bees, and wasps are in the category Hymenoptera. The bees descended from the wasp, and so they, they sometimes might look alike. But wasps in general will have a smoother body and a very pinched waist, more, much more so than a bee. Um, their bodies are usually longer, than, longer and leaner than that of bees, and they might also have spurs or spikes on their legs. As with the bees, most wasps are solitary. Uh, we may be fam more familiar, again, we tend to be familiar with this, the, the social um, um, bees and wasps, uh, like the yellow jackets and the paper wasps, because you're more likely to see a group of them at one time around the nest. But there's, there are many solitaires flying here and there, looking for food, getting a little nectar. So when you get used to kind of looking at the sand wasp, you can see the smoothness of its body, uh, that it does have a bit of a pinched waist. And uh, this is a fast moving insect. So it's not the, it's uh, got a little bit of a, a running blur to it, it's, but it does have these um, spurs on its legs. Now this wasp really shows off what we more commonly recognize as pinched waist. Uh, the section connecting the thorax here um, to uh, the abdomen. This is actually the first segment of the abdomen. It's called a petiole. And that petiole gives the wasp a lot more flexibility to lay eggs 
um, in, um, and, and to sting its prey. So the bees don't need that much flexibility because they're not stinging prey. So it's a common thread-waisted wasp. They make their burrows in the dirt. They um, hunt for caterpillars for their young and they will find one and they will sting it to paralyze it. And then she'll carry the prey back to the burrow to tuck inside the nest next to the egg she'll lay. And the prey actually remains alive, preserved for slow motion eating by the newly hatched larva that eats non-essential parts first. But then by the time the wasp is ready to pupate, the whole caterpillar has been consumed. So the uh, adult thread-waisted wasps get their energy from nectar. Flowers and pollinator gardens are a great place to observe them. And they are beneficial pollinator, pollinators, even though they do not purposely collect pollen, but you got some pollen grains here on um, this, this wasp. Another thread-waisted wasp is the mud dauber. They are above ground nesters forming their nest with mud and they collect mud from the shores of lakes and creeks, roll it into a ball and carry it with their mandibles and their front legs back to the nest site. And I'm gonna put a link in the text chat for a video of mud daubers collecting and, and carrying the mud and you'll wanna take a look at that, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> their food choice is usually spiders same drill, paralyze the prey with their stinger, carry it back to the nest with the spines on their legs, helping them to grab it. And then the growing larva eats the preserved spider. And wasps come in a variety of sizes. Uh, this wasp is about half a centimeter. It's um, one of the parasitic wasps. So rather than building a nest for its young, neither social nor solitary nest. They just go straight to the prey and deposit her eggs in a host insect. No need for a nest. But they are very useful to humans for biological um, control of pest insects, especially in um, farming crops. So parasitic wasps range in size from the very tiny, three or four millimeters, to very large, um, five centimeters, which is about two inches. Um, they hang out on leaves and tree bark looking for a host for their young. And the females have that very noticeable ovipositor here in our little tiny insect and here in this giant ichnomian wasp. <clears throat> so that's what she actually uses to lay her eggs. They look aggressive but it's not a stinger, it's just the ovipositor. Now, if you handle it, they might jab you, but it doesn't have any venom. So moving back to the more colorful. Now, you might be able to tell from the female of this species um, what it is. So what do you think about that? You saw the male, might be a little more questionable. But if you notice the pollen carrying hairs of the bee, you are correct. So, but when you see the smooth body of the male, you might first think, yeah, it's a wasp. So earlier I mentioned that wasps and bees are in the same insect order um, and they're usually distinguished by what they eat. But visually, the um, presence of hairs or spurs can be a good indicator of whether or not it's a pollen carrying bee or a prey carrying wasp. Or sometimes if you notice those long ovipositors, that would be the indicator that it's a parasitic wasp. Another green insect. Now you might think when you first see them, they're quick darting about that they are bees, but you're gonna generally find them on leaves, not flowers. 
and they are flies. They hang out on those leaves basking in the sun and waiting for small insects to come along because these particular insects are predators as adults and as larvae. So the adults eat um, insects and the larvae eat insects. Uh, the larvae are on their own, unlike the bees where, or the wasps where the parent will bring the larva back to the nest, uh, the uh, larvae are on their own with, with these flies. They are considered to be beneficial for control of gardener's pests such as mites, thrips, and leafhoppers, and even predators of termites. Here we have a bit of a um, thread waste. So you might think wasp, but those eyes, another fly, small antenna. This fly is a predator on aphids in the larval stage. And in the adult stage, it um, laps up the necker with its um, sponge-like tongue. These flies are really quite aerobatic. Um, I see them in the spring right out my front door, hovering, flying a little back, flying a little forth. And while they don't have a second pair of wings, flies do have an appendage. You can kind of see it here in this um, photo. It's called a halter. That functions as sort of a gyroscope to keep the fly balanced and allow it to spin and dip and zig and, 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 and hover. And they're very, um, these particular flies are very fast flyers and very, very good at hovering. All right, so we get to a wingless insect. Um, we know it's an insect because it has six legs. Very hard to tell because this is a running insect, but you've got a little one, two, three legs there. So you might think it's an ant, but it's actually, and you did anticipate a butt there, right? <laughs> this is a wingless wasp. It's more hairy than an ant. So on the hairiness scale, bees at the top, wasp in the middle, ants at the bottom. Um, and, but it has, um, its common name is, it's really misnamed. It's called a velvet ant, but they are actually wasp. The females, females are wingless and she runs around the ground looking for other uh, nesting uh, uh, insects, nesting bees actually. Um, so she'll, lay an egg um, in the nest of bees and the eggs hatch and the larvae eat the bees. Um, she has no wings, so she has no need for flight muscles, but her bulky leg muscles make up for it by allowing her to run fast since she is, uh, she, she is limited to the ground. Now males do have wings, but they don't have a stinger. Now this particular species of wasp uh, very much looks like an ant. Um, the, the cow killer velvet ant is um, a little bit more commonly known velvet ant, um, and it's an example of the, the more hairy um, wasp. Um, they, are, they are named, these cow killer um, wasps are named for their painful sting, although they haven't really been known actually to, to kill a cow. And here she is um, burrowing into the ground looking for a, a nest to, somebody else's nest to lay her egg in. So are we still looking at wasp? Um, this is a, a long and skinny insect. Um, you'll find small groups flying around pollinator gardens in the summer. Uh, but this is actually a, a, a beetle. So how do we know it's a beetle? Beetles account for 25% of all life forms on the planet. So if insects are um, more numerous than any other um, life form, um, the beetles are at the top of the heap um, in terms of um, how many there are. 
Uh, with that many species, uh, they're going to have many shapes and sizes, and also many shapes and sizes of antenna. Some very ornate with branches and cones. That's one indicator of a beetle, though all not, not all beetles have those um, antenna structures. The distinctive characteristic of beetles are their elytra, the hardened forewings. Um, when they are not flying, the hind wings are hidden under their elytra. When they, um, they, they are membranous wings that, that we're sort of familiar with in other insects. When not flying, their wings meet right in the middle. They're, they just fold right and, and meet. The hard outer wings are not functional for flight, but they add, may add stability. And so the beetle holds them open um, and the hind wing powers the flight. You can see the elytra in this photo of a flying delta scarab be beetle. And it's also an example of that ornate antenna branched in this case. So here is our flower longhorn beetle ready for flight. The membranous wings ready to go, the elytra just held steady. As adults, they um, consume nectar and they're um, considered to be pollinators. So beetles, pollinators, well, the beetles and the flies also have been pollinating for a lot longer than the bees. They've actually been around for a lot longer than bees, so they've had more of an opportunity. Um, they've been around for about 3 million years, um, over twice as long as the bees. But the bees just got better at it because they want the pollen. The larva of the flower longhorn beetle feeds on plants boring into stems and trunks and roots. Not usually a pest problem though. Now at a glance, you might think this beetle is a bumblebee because it's, it's pretty hairy and it's got the coloring of a bumblebee, but it has the, that elytra, the hardened wings that kind of, they kind of have a shine to them and it's got those um, ornate antenna. This is the Texas flower scarab. This species, um, with all those hairs, is um, when you see them um, on certain plants, they're obviously good pollinators. Uh, they, they, they actually consume pollen in addition to nectar. So they, they go after the pollen, and, but the larvae feed on rotten wood and veget vegetation. So they're de decomposers who keep the environment clean. Obviously not a vegetarian. Are, um, all beetles are not vegetarian. So this is the stick, six spotted tiger beetle, which feeds on other invertebrates as an adult and in the larval stage. These are very fast um, little crawlers. They fly low to the ground, run, fly, run, fly. If you take a walk in the late spring along the blackjack trail up at Leela or on the dirt trails at Moss Park off of Greenville Avenue, you're likely to see them flying low to the ground on the hunt. And this one has grabbed itself or its young, um, a, a caterpillar. Well, actually, uh, it, it's grabbed itself a caterpillar. Its young probably find their own. And this is another carnivore. Um, we've not seen anything like this today yet. It is a bug. This is the bee assassin. So the common characteristic of the true bugs is the contrast of the upper part of the forewing and the lower part of the forewing. The upper part is leathery or hardened and the lower part is membranous. So unlike the beetle, this with its entire um, hardened forewing, um, this um, bug will, instead of meeting in the, um, folding its wings to meet in the middle, it folds its wings so that they overlap. So you'll, you'll see that um, in, in the bugs. But if you get the side view, you can see the mouth part that really sets this order apart from others. They have a long, rigid, rigid proboscis known as a beak. 
Um, it is uh, what entomologists label a piercing sucking mouth part, and it hinges to move from its carrying position under the abdomen out to the feeding position. The assassins and other predaceous bugs use the beak to stab their prey, inject an enzyme to liquefy the insides, and then in reverse, they siphon out the fluids and that's their meal. And here you see one in action with its beak in the bee. We won't spend too much time on that because that's, um, they, they do go after some of the um, beneficial um, insects themselves. So not, so we'll just move right along and say that not all bugs are assassin. These colorful bugs are large milkweed bugs. They are plant eaters. They use their beak to suck oils and nutrients out of seeds and leaves of milkweed plants. Now, all the insects we've looked at up to now have the larval and pupal stage, um, both the larval and the pupal stage um, caterpillar. Um, but the bugs metamorphosis is incomplete and they come out of the egg crawling. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And, and again, you can see those little developing wings and the developed wings. Milkweed is a very popular host plant. In addition to the large milkweed bug, there's also a small milkweed bug and a milkweed beetle. Um, <coughs> and there's other insects that mimic those. So the coloring for all of those milkweed insects is black and orange. And another famous black and orange insect also feeds on milkweed. So we'll learn a bit more about milkweed feeders um, in a few minutes. So what does this insect look like? How about now? With that beak, it's got to be a bug. You can actually see the long mouth part that um, is folded down under its abdomen. This is a nymph of the Texas bow-legged bug that feeds on plants and seeds in the legume family, using the beak to pierce the plant and siphon out the oils and, snap and saps. Now, as an adult, it's no longer an ant mimic, but you can see how it gets its name with these bow legs. Um, leading on, here is the ant. So the side-by-side -side comparison shows the wasp, the ant, and the bug. The wasp and the ant exhibit that more pinched waist. I don't know how much these are here. And um, the bug does not have that pinched waist, waist and, and with it, since the nymph is just developing wings, but you can see them here. The wasp and the ant are examples of mimicry where two equally noxious species look similar, providing protection sort of by the numbers. The more of us that look this way, the more predators will avoid us. Um, the bug and the ant is an example of one harmless species mimicking a stinging species. And uh, if you watch, if you can find these bugs, um, this is on a um, euphorbia plant. Um, they, they behave like an ant paper. in the way it crawls about the plant. And it also waves its antenna like an ant. Uh, so not just mimicking in looks, but in um, actions. Um, and squeezing in another mimic here, there's also a beetle that mimics an ant. <laughs> and here we have an insect that instead of protecting itself by looking like another insect, it protects itself by blending in with its environment. And um, where does this fit in, in the insect orders? So, well, you might think it's a beetle, it's kind of shiny or, or even a moth. But it's also a bug, and this is the camel uh, tree hopper. That shield shape is not a wing. It's actually an it's, um, extension of its thorax. And it might look like a, um, it looks like a, it, it, it has the coloring that blends in to um, the plants. It's most likely found on oak trees where it siphons the juices of the leaves and stems. 
And these are, are very small insects. They're, they're less than a centimeter. And this insect is only slightly larger. At first glance, it may seem similar in shape, but when you, so when you just see something crawling around, the tendency is to want to kind of group things by general shape. Uh, but this is a moth. <clears throat> and one of these is a moth. So what are the clues that you're looking at a moth versus another insect? And what, is a, what are the clues that you're looking at a moth um, instead of a butterfly? So moths and butterflies are both in the order Lepidoptera, meaning scaly wing. And the half yellow moth that we saw is it has scales. So that's one indicator that it's not the bug. The wing membranes are covered with those. Um, they're actually um, modified flattened hairs that probably evolved so they get some insulation. But then from there, um, we evolve all the wonderful colors and patterns of butterflies and moths. The moth here is on the left and the butterfly is on the right. Um, both butterflies and moths can be very tiny or very large. Butterflies um, are, are, are moths um, are not just the small ones. Um, you can have some very, very tiny butterflies. Butterflies are generally active during the day. So that's one clue that you're looking at a butterfly. Moths are generally active at night, but there are some day flying moths. And taking a closer look at rest, the moth will um, hold its wings over its body and the butterfly will hold its wings up uh, vertically. Or maybe out on the same plane, but not back over its body. The butterfly antenna end with a um, club-like knob and the moth antenna may be long filaments or they may have comb-like structures. Um, and sometimes they will fold them back over their body and sometimes they'll hold them out in front of their head. But the butterflies are gonna always have their uh, antenna straight out. So, as adults, both the moth and the butterfly have sipping mouth parts, a long proboscis that they extend and retract as they move from flower to flower to sip nectar. So unlike the hinging beak of the bugs, the lepidoptera curl up the, their proboscis when they're not drinking. So this yellow colored, colored snake, say it again, the yellow colored scape moth shows off the comb-like antenna and the proboscis that they are using to sip the nectar of this flower. So are you looking at a tree trunk here or what else do you see? So as we've seen in other orders, some insects get protection from predators by looking like their surroundings. And there are actually two here, here and here. This is the sad underwing moth. Uh, this moth does not have the comb-like antenna, but it also doesn't have the bulbs. It's just the filaments. And the forest is the best place to find a sad underwing. The adult underwing moths are more likely to feed on sweet tree sap than they are to feed on nectar. And the caterpillar host plants are hickory and pecans. So each species of moth and butterfly is usually associated with a host plant. And that's not the flower it gets its nectar from, but it's the plant that provides the food in the larval stage. So as this butterfly does, uh, the clubbed antenna says butterfly, um, but this insect is actually too famous for a, a, a quiz. You probably recognize this as the monarch butterfly. It's probably the most famous example of a host plant specific larva. The, the adult pictured here is nectaring on mist mis flower, but the female will lay her eggs on milkweed where the caterpillar will eat with, the, with chewing mouth parts. So the butterfly begins life in the larva with chewing mouth parts and then develops those um, sipping mouth parts as in the, in the pupa as they go through metamorphosis. 
So by consuming milkweed, even just in the larval stage, they have um, developed a tolerance and they benefit from the protection it offers them. They ingest the toxins and that anything that eats them um, gets a dose of those toxins. So they have also warned predators of their toxicity because they don't want a predator trying to eat them. They just want to avoid uh, the predators altogether. But that uh, pattern is also copied by another species for protection. Um, one of these is a monarch and the other is a viceroy. The caterpillar of um, this mimic does not feed on milkweed, it feeds on willows. So do you know, is it left or right for the viceroy? So it's a monarch on the left, the viceroy on the right. And so how can you tell? Well, the wing veins create cells and on the monarch, the upper cell on the forewing is, is just one large cell. Whereas on the viceroy, it, it is that um, area is divided into a large and a smaller cell. And in the viceroy, on the lower wing, you can see a line dividing all these perpendicular cells. And so, you know, that's how we can tell the difference. But um, do you think a bird going in for a meal is diagramming the wing cells of these insects? No, they're just gonna avoid both of them. And therefore the viceroy gets that protection. Now, another mimic of sorts, perhaps resembling a bumblebee is the clear wing moth. It's actually larger than a bee uh, with some similarities in coloration. Um, and this um, gives you a picture of what um, those wings might look like because the clear wing doesn't have scales on most of its wing. Another distinction between moths and butterflies is that moths tend to be furrier, and this is a definitely an example of, of that, even though you, you may not notice that all the time. Now, here's a surprising insect. Antenna, eyes, hair, scales, shape, spikes. Now, this is actually my favorite insect. This is the scaly bee fly. It's my favorite mainly because it fooled me at first. And when I figured it out, I just got so excited. And I also think it's just really kind of a lovely insect. Um, it's very small, actually about a centimeter, but it's got a lot going on because it has these longer antenna with these little, this little fringe on them. It does have big eyes. I mean, the eyes take up almost all the head, but it's a small head. And then it also has scales that create this fringe on it, the tip of its abdomen. Um, and um, its scientific name is just so poetic also. It just makes me like it even more. Lepidophora lepido, lepidocera, um, with the root word for scale in both the genus and the species parts of its name. Now this uh, fly is, it's young or sol, parrots, parasites of solitary wasps while the adult soaks up nectar. We're gonna look at several mimicking flies here. You may think that the scaly bee fly is a mimic of this creature, but maybe this creature and the scaly bee fly are mimics of the bumblebee. This is the robber fly. And this is a predator of a wide variety of insects. As adults, it feeds on flying insects. As a larva, it feeds on the larval stages. You'll find them hanging out in, on a leaf in the dappled sun, just waiting for a meal. They, they can catch their meal in midair, fun to watch. And we can turn the question around here, like what is this fly mimicking? A bee or a wasp perhaps? This is one of the hoverflies, also known as a flower fly. It's another tiny insect, um, difficult to identify from it from a distance. People often who know that I like insects will show me a picture and they'll say, is this, a, what kind of bee is this? And I'm like, it's a fly. Um, and they have a, a appetite for aphids as larvae. So they're one that is very much appreciated by gardeners keeping other insects in check, the pests. And while we're on a roll here with fly mimicry, what's the model of this fly? 
while I present to you the beetle fly. It occurred to me that perhaps um, with all the mimicry that goes on with flies, they must mimic a beetle. And I finally found that they, that in um, ranging in Southeast Asia, there are these uh, beetle flies. So this is the only picture that I didn't take in this whole set of pictures, but I just, um, I just wanted to point out that they um, mimic everything. Um, and like the tree hopper, the shell is, it may, may look like a beetle, but it's really an extension of the thorax. But, but you know it's a fly because it's got the fly antenna and it has the big eyes in relation to its head. And this adaptation is, is really kind of a mystery why would it would occur, um, but insects are amazingly varied and upon closer inspection, inspire curiosity and admiration. So, so many insects, so little time. <laughs> that was just kind of a scratch of the surface with them. Um, just five of the insect orders out of the total of 26. There's also the dragonflies, the grasshoppers, the net wings, the mantids, the crickets, and others. Um, now, most you'll never see. There are some mega insects and colorful charismatic insects, but for the most part, they hide or hide in plain sight. They're in the dirt and they are just so widely diverse. They're small, but powerful. They are important for the whole ecosystem, from the soil to the plants, to the birds and other animals, and to the humans. 99% good. So go out and look for some insects to admire and appreciate. Go nature. And where can you go? Well, I captured uh, most of these insects in parks and green spaces in the Dallas area from north to south, east to west. The Metroplex has many um, places where you can go and find flowers and trees and uh, ground to, uh, to observe the insects and encounter nature. So back to the challenge. Is it less of a challenge than it was in the beginning? Um, were there any surprises for you? So we have um, a beetle, number one, a butterfly. That was probably the most obvious one. Number three is a fly, my fly. Number four is a moth. Five is a wasp. Six is a fly. Seven is a bee. Eight is a fly. Nine is a bug. Okay, flies are my favorite. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions here. Um, so yes, do, Laura, uh, we've got one question from Jessica. Uh, does Texas have a state insect? Uh, the monarch. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Get lots of uh, positive feedback uh, coming in. Um, and. Great presentation, amazing pictures, and uh, a comment from Nancy, no one can spot an insect, insect as well as Laura. Points. Well, I know that there, uh, I think I looked at the participant list and I think there's some other amazing photographers and um, insect hunters out there among you. So I encourage everybody to go out and, and uh, find some insects and, uh, um, oops, I moved too fast there. I guess we are at the end, but uh, we're still in questions. Um, so yeah, they're, they're fun. They're a lot of fun. Uh, Laura, I have a question uh, while we're waiting to see if uh, our audience has any more. When moths have like uh, simulated eyes on the wings, is that considered a form of mimicry? Um, I don't, I don't know if it's mimicry, it, it's sort of, um, it's more like a camouflage, I think. So they're, they're trying to, um, I mean, I, you know, mimicry, camouflage, they're trying to look like something that they're not, but that's more like um, um, looking uh, bigger and meaner than, than you are, I guess. A lot of moths that look like snakes too.
I guess I'll have to look up the technical definition there of what that type of um, look alikeness is. All right, any more questions before we wrap it up? Okay, thank you so much, Laura. And uh, thanks everybody who joined us for today's presentation. And we hope to see you at our next Master Naturalist Present talk. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.